wanted to get to your body of work, which which I uh, found amazing. So let's start with your film, which is uh, The Water of Life in Gaelic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I was um I'm lo I'm loving that you're mentioning that yeah because it's um it, it's a few years ago now but it was the first thing I suppose that I did I was working with a director at the time called Sean O'Connor and we made it for I think we had like maybe about 400 quid or something you know it was like real like it was just the idea and I got a lend of these old costumes and he's such a creative director and a creative cinematographer that we piece something together without any money you know so we kept shooting stuff that would would not reveal the fact that we didn't have any money and uh, like it won all these awards in the States and um, it just went and took on a life of its own. But I suppose even at that age, so like that was one of the first major things I'd done. I was in my 20s um, and I learned very quickly that it's kind of all about the story. So that's what I've tried to do in my work, that the primary thing is always the story. Hopefully the characters as well. You don't have to have a whole bunch of money like around you know, a few years ago, I've done a sitcom at RTE, which is our national broadcaster here in Ireland. And they give you some money. And um, I don't seem to have any avenue to get back in the door with RTE for reasons we might get into. Um, but it's funny. I'm back at a point now where I kind of don't have money again. And I'm still making stuff that I'm very proud of and that I'm very kind of happy with. So I don't know, like you need some money, I suppose. But you you got to just do what you you really want to do be authentic about it and just kind of make it happen. So that's kind of been my my work. That short film did really well. I I did a play in 2012 that toured Edinburgh, toured internationally. Um, and yeah, I suppose my route into comedy then would be I'd always been kind of making jokes backstage at serious plays or, you know, I had an I had a, an acting audition or um, agent for years and she'd put me up for these kind of small roles in shows like Game of Thrones and whatnot. And I'd just be laughing my way through the auditions. I just found me trying to be an actor ridiculous because um, I suppose I have the soul of a clown maybe. Um, so then it was this slow process to try and get up on stage and demand that people sit down and listen to me shout jokes at them. I just thought that was the most audacious, arrogant thing that you could do. And <laughs> So there was a process to kind of do that. That started in 2014. And to... To move things on a little bit, um, you know, I had some success in a, in a troupe called Cahoots. We did a lot of work with RTE, as I say. But when the lockdown kicked in or just before it, I kind of thought to myself, hold on a second now. I've gotten sober um, and getting sober is the big part of getting sober is being authentic and being the real person that you are and not pretending to be somebody else. And the type of comedy that I was doing up until lockdown, it was kind of trying to be liked a little bit. It was trying to get people in positions of power to like me in Britain and Ireland, like the BBCs of the world um, and not be controversial. Yet my own politics were, I mean, I don't think my politics are controversial in the same way that you don't think your politics is controversial, but it's against the grain, I suppose. And it's not very popular amongst establishment thinkers. So around lockdown, lockdown time, I, I thought to myself, I want to do this one man show about my alcoholism Nobody's interested in it in around me. It feels like it's mad, but I'm going to do it. And then I did that and it became probably the most successful thing I'd done. And it was touring all over Britain and Ireland and it got lots of great reviews and won awards and whatnot. And then when lockdown kicked in, I just thought, you know what? I'm going to do the sketch comedy that I've always wanted to do. I'm going to do political comedy. I'm going to take the piss out of the British Empire. I'm going to take the piss out of establishment Ireland. Um, and I'm going to really hit the American empire hard. Cause I mean, that's the stuff that I've been reading about since college. And, you know, I'd have conversations with friends of mine, which I'm sure you, you've had many conversations where, you know, I'd be, I'd be kind of rabbiting the Chomsky line of America being the, the biggest terrorist state in the world. And they'd laugh. They'd be like, what? No, America hasn't really done that much bad. Have they? Like, I mean, they're not like the real bad, bad states. And I'm like, wow, that propaganda is a hell of a drug. Like, so I thought, look, there's a little niche there for me to, to follow in the footsteps of all these amazing journalists and writers that I've been reading my whole life and try and contribute to what they're doing with a little bit of comedy. And that really has been my, my raison d'etre for the last few years. And with that, as you know, comes a lot of people telling you well done and a lot of people threatening to burn your house down. <laughs> yes, yes. But I, I, could you tell a little bit of our audience about your book? Let's talk about your book for a second, because I, I love memoirs. I've written one as well. And I'm writing the epilogue right now because stuff oh, happened wow. up in Russia. But um, you 
but your book is so amazing and it ties into you, your one man show. So Reef, if you could bring up the, the book cover so people oh, can thanks, read guys. it. This yeah, so a, it's, it's go ahead. So, so you bring a book about sobriety to your Christmas celebrations, particularly <laughs> Irish. I, I like this. <laughs> Yes, it's actually selling quite well for Christmas, would you believe? So I'm, I'm hoping to root. I'm hoping to ruin people's Christmas. I mean, that's my that's always been my angle, and and I did that spectacularly in my drinking. So I don't see why I shouldn't do it in my sobriety. But uh, yeah, so it's called a portrait of the of the piss artist as a young man. It's a playful reference to one of my heroes, Joyce, whose dad's from Cork. It's important to note that, um, and yeah, it's like it's my version of my story importantly I suppose not just about I didn't want to write a memoir about like a drunk and look at all these funny escapades that I got up to I mean there's some funny episodes in it but I just wanted to write something more than and then I went on the piss and went to London for three days and I forgot to contact my family because I didn't think there was anything interesting about that so what I tried to do instead was to focus on the prototype of an alcoholic like what were the, the, the causes and conditions that made me an alcoholic. And I'm, again, I'm hopefully doing it in a playful way, but like a lot of us, like with an Irish background, I grew up in a house with a lot of alcoholism, a lot of dysfunction, a lot of trauma. And I'm and hopefully the book doesn't blame anyone, but this is the kind of incubation period that I had. And I felt really anxious and I felt uncomfortable in my own skin and of course, I wouldn't have used these terms at the time. And I certainly didn't use them when I was drinking because the lads I was drinking with would have been like, what's he on? Um, <laughs> but I got to a point, I suppose, when I was maybe 15-ish and I thought, OK, I feel really uncomfortable all the time at this point. What am I going to do? This is weird. Do I need to go to a doctor or a psychiatric ward or what's the story? And then I started drinking cans of cider and I felt no pain, no uncomfortableness and the bonus was I also felt much more than I ever, ever was to begin with, like a kind of a superhero transformative effect. So the book, in a way, it's called, it could have been called Gatman. That was one title we had for it at the time because Cork, Corkish for drinking is Gat. And it's kind of about that superhero metamorphosis from going from an uncomfortable, fastidious kid to a superhero through alcohol. Um, and then... From there, it goes so well for a certain period. And of course, then it crashes. And I got to deal with the mental illness that kind of underpins the drinking all along. And that involves a reconciliation with, with my mother and all that kind of stuff. So I know this sounds extremely, extremely painful, but I do promise it is quite funny as well in parts. I'm sure it is. And, <laughs> and you, have, you have a talent for that, um, for sure. I, you know, I'm going to ask you a question that I, I literally... I don't even like it when people ask me this, but it is an interesting question to those of us that are writers or creators of any kind, which is a lot of people. Um, what is your process like with writing a memoir and, and coming up with your sketches? What's your process? How do you how do you do that? How do you come up with that material? I think like, you know, I kind of see myself as a kind of a jack of all trades. So I do lots of different things because I'm interested in lots of different things. You know, um, I never set out to one motivation for doing lots of things was the fact that, you know, in Ireland, particularly like you couldn't possibly survive as an actor unless you're like Killian Murphy or whatnot. So you end up having to do lots of different things. And um, so I have got a slightly different process for all of them, I think. But the memoir was a kind of a, a discussion with myself on how best to be honest, because I felt like in recovery circles, I only really connected with people when they talked to me and I felt they were being totally honest. So I thought if I was going to help someone who might be struggling with drinking or someone in their family who was struggling with drinking, I'd only be able to reach them if I was totally honest. So that was quite easy. Then the process was quite easy because I just kind of um, voice noted a lot of the work or I just kind of like throw stuff out really untamed and then I'd fix it all later. You know, so there was a completely different process to what I'm what I'm used to. The memoir basically on draft one was a disgrace. Like it was all all over the place. It was just a collection of stories. But if I was if I felt something emote, I'd write it. So at the start, I didn't intend to write about my dad. And then there ended up being a chapter about him and um, because I could just see him in my mind's eye. He's no longer with us, sadly. And um, but I could just picture him when I was a kid. And then I just threw all that out. And as I say, redrafted it like 10 times. And that was my kind of process for a memoir. For a sketch, for instance, um, and weirdly, somebody was asking me about this yesterday. It always starts with kind of close to the full idea in my head. So, for instance, I put out a sketch uh, today called Anti-Semitism, 
And I thought about like the different modes of propaganda that I feel the Israeli regime uses. And one of them, well, all of them are ludicrous, in my opinion. All of them are actually ludicrous. So they're ripe for satire. And um, so I just tried to look at the anti-Semitism one. And, and I thought if you really strip that back and if it was a bunch of lads chatting and there was one was kicking the head off another lad, let's really strip it back. And what what would the opponent say if you presented this fact to them that if you criticize me kicking his head in, you're actually against my religion. And it's so ludicrous that the actual propaganda does all the hard work for you. Like they do all the writing for me. All you need to do is just tune into what they're doing. And if anything, a tricky thing with satirizing the Israeli regime is that it's it's really quite difficult because their their propaganda is so ridiculous. And um, okay. if it wasn't so destructive and if they weren't carrying out genocide, they in themselves would be hilarious. But of course, it's not funny, you know, the effect of that propaganda. But you know what I'm getting at? It's, it's I'm sending up something that's already sent up. So with that, it'll always come with the idea. And then I just like shape the characters around it. They can be quite quick, to be honest with you. But it's quick now, but it took like probably a few years research so that you actually kind of know what you're talking about and you can tap into the propaganda. Exactly. You need some historical background and, and reference, yeah. which, you, which you provide. Um, let, let's do that. Let's go ahead, um, Reef, if you don't mind, and play. It's a one minute one of, of, of your first, one of your first, one of your earlier ones um, near to October 7th, I believe, that went viral. So, um, Reef, if you could hook it up for our audience. Thank you. Dude, what the hell are you doing? Defending myself? What's it to you? You're going to kill him. Oh, my God. Why do you hate all followers of my faith so much? What's happening? You criticizing me means you hate me and all adherence to my religion. I couldn't care less what religion you are, buddy. I just want you to stop beating that guy to death. Ah, you see? Defending him. <laughs> that means you hate us. That's not true. I detest what you're doing in our name. Well, that's because you hate yourself. Mate, this isn't about your religion. Just be reasonable, yeah? <laughs> They're doing it again. Yeah, sorry guys. Uh, if you criticize him, you're anti his religion. So. But that's ridiculous. <sighs> like, it is a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Want me to tell everyone what you did to my grandparents again? He's right, you're wrong, move along. Oh, and both of you just lost your jobs. That's awesome. And that was the one you were just talking about. That was, it, it wasn't the earlier one I thought, but that was hilarious. Um, that was good, but it was hilarious and sad and poignant, but good. Very good. That's yeah. Awesome. And you were touching earlier in your intro about comedy, right? So I was wondering about doing comedy in this period. And it's funny, right? The, the, the people who will be most pious about it. So I've had very few comments, believe it or not, from people saying you shouldn't be doing comedy. Now I've had a deluge of comments saying I am a piece of shit and I need to die. And, uh, I, hey, I'm a Zionist witch. I've just put a spell on you. I've had lots of comments like that, but I've had a few comments of like, this isn't the time for comedy. And they've all been from Irish people. Would you believe it? Um, oh. The absolute majority of Palestinians have been saying, like, we we didn't think we were capable of laughing at the moment, but you just gave us a laugh. And that means more to me than, than anything I can tell you, because to feel that there's some sort of utility outside of the joke itself is... It's life affirming for for a comedian, I think. I think it's so essential that we laugh at ourselves and just the absurdity of our humanity and, and the way we behave. And and you know, as advanced as our technology is, but we our emotional intelligence as a species is just you know it's still back with Neanderthals, if you will, as mm. far as each other. And and um, you know, it's not it's not kind and it's not good. Um, but yeah, we need to laugh and, 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 and also we need joy in our life. We need to find that. And what's been hard for people. Oh, you mentioned, by the way, you mentioned the witch. Don't worry. I'm a Celtic witch. So I'll just, I'll reverse the hacks and you're fine. Don't worry. Yes. There's one of my relatives hanged. Don't worry. We're, we're good. We're <laughs> We've got you. No, I know. <laughs> Long story. It was over property, but they made it like witchcraft or whatever. Of course um, it's over property. Classic Ireland. Yeah, over proper <laughs> defense, right? I liked your um, premise when you did the one about the shed and the house. Um, and I'm not sure we have that one, but that's okay. People can find it online. That was uh, one of the earlier ones. And I had shared it a couple of times before I had the um, opportunity to uh, connect with you. And 
what I really uh, am amazed about this is that how people don't see how this is so much, how the Gaza Strip is so much an open air prison. So let's delve right into Palestine. And I wanted to get a sense from you, what, what drew you to that activism um, initially, but also Ireland itself and your community, um, Ireland is really, really kind of getting behind the Palestinian people for the most part. Mm. And uh, it's good to see a country like really, you know, speaking out about it. Um, so let's talk about that before we get into some censorship, which will come later. But could you could you talk a little bit about that journey? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> 